Okay, welcome, good evening. We did not give class at our usual time, which is Sunday morning. So that's why the class has changed from Sunday morning Torah and coffee to Monday evening uh, Torah and tea because I was traveling. In fact, I literally just got back from the airport. I went for a beautiful simcha. It was a wedding at the at uh, the, in Crown Heights. It was a wedding uh, by at the Denbrook family, my brother-in-law and the nephew. My nephew got married uh, by Denbrook's son, Mendel, and it was really a beautiful, beautiful simcha. So uh, <clears throat> we were traveling all day, and I really didn't have, sometimes while I'm traveling, I try to find a couple of moments to be able to give the class, but I just couldn't. So we're here tonight, um, and um, we want to share Torah for this week. I got requests, what's happening with the class, what's happening with learning, and that's good. That's good when people are hungry for Torah learning. It's a good thing. So first, let's make a bracha on the tea. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam sh'hakol niya bidvaro. Ah, very good. I could also <laughs> tell you that it was like the coldest night in, in uh, New York that it's been this winter. It was windy last night. It was in the low 20s uh, and coming back here to Florida. Uh, nice and warm, so so that's wonderful. Okay, so <clears throat> can frogs talk? Do frogs talk? So I will share with you some fascinating stuff, and I will address the tunnel situation in Crown Heights. I've gotten so many questions about that, but my primary objective is not here to be a, sort of a news report and tell you uh, all the ins and outs and all the uh, all the uh, politics or whatever it might be that, that people sometimes have, organizations have, individuals have. Really a lesson. I want to I want to learn a lesson. But I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insight, but that's not my objective over here. My objective over here is to learn Torah and to like take a lesson from the Torah. So here again, L'chaim, you guys didn't remind me. Do I have change in my pocket? Let's see. Let me get some change because I always start the class with putting a couple of coins in the pushka, which I will do right now. Let's put some coins in the pushka so that we have some blessings over here. Okay, so first, I'm going to get to the tunnels later in the class. So you're going to have to just to have patience. First, I want to talk about it, and it's all going to be connected. I want to talk about do frogs talk. We're reading about the 10 plagues. We're learning about the 10 plagues. We all know the 10 plagues, right? The Eden went out of Mitzrayim. <coughs> and, they, um, and before they went out of Egypt, God had to send 10 plagues to Egypt. We've all, to the Egyptians, we've all learned about that during the Seder night. And <coughs> I want to I tell you a story. It's a beautiful story. And, you know, for those of us who love nature, will appreciate the story even more. Um, there's a story that after the Mizritcha Magid, the Mizritcha Magid was a, <coughs> a student of the Baal Shem Tov. And he was a teacher <coughs> of the, um, he was a, he was the second in line of the founder of Hasidus, the Baal Shem Tov being the founder of the Hasidic movement. Then there was the Mizritcha Magid. And, what happened was that after the Magid passed away, the Magid was the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, who was uh, the founder, as I mentioned, of Chabad. And he had many very holy, very lofty um, students that were all students of the Magid. Uh, <clears throat> great master and teacher of Kabbalah, Hasidus, and so on. After the Magid passed away, the Alter Rebbe was sitting with some of his students sorry, with some of his colleagues, and they were talking and they were reminiscing and, and sharing inspirational stories of their teacher, the Magid. And at one point, the Altarebbe asked them the following question. His question was, do you guys know why every single morning our teacher, our master, Hasidic master, the Magid, would, um, <clears throat> would go out to the... Uh, to the river or lake or pond, and would sit and listen to the frogs, to the croaking of the frogs. He did this regularly. So, 
They said, no, we have no idea. So the Alter Rebbe said that the Magid, because he knew the language of the frogs and the animals, he would go out there and he would hear the praise, the, the, the praising, the, the shirav tishbachot, the song and the praising that the, the frogs would, <clears throat> would praise, HaKadosh Baruch would praise God Almighty. And there is a sefer, there's a book called Pirkei Shira, which is actually a sefer that records the language of the animals, of many different animals, and what they are saying. And here the Alter Rebbe said, the Magid, because of his uh, sensitivity, his spiritual holy sensitivity, would sit and listen to what the um, to what the frogs would say, and he would hear them saying, praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu, praising God Almighty. <clears throat> Specifically, in fact, the Rebbe, the Rebbe in Tafshin Yud Aleph, in the, f- the first year that the Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, became the Rebbe of Chabad, at that point they did not have a dedicated place for where to do Tashlich. On Rosh Hashanah, we go to a body of water and we, uh, we do the Tashlich. There was no dedicated place for Tashlich. So the Rebbe would. So they went to look for a place. As they were looking for a place, and they, they it is there should be fish in the place because fish represents God's open eyes. They were looking for fish. As they were doing so, the Rebbe told them the following: The Rebbe said that once Reb Chaim Vital, student of the Holy Arizal, if you had been to Tzmat, you know who the Holy Arizal is. The student of the Holy Arizal was <coughs> was at a body of water, and he was saying Torah. He was saying the words of Torah, which that Rizal revealed the deepest secrets of the of a Kabbalan through his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, and some frog stuck out its head. And the students apparently were distracted a bit, and they wanted to chase it away. And the, uh, the Rabbi Chaim Vital said to them that, leave it alone, it came here to hear Torah. There's obviously a deeper meaning over here. Now, what do the frogs say? What do the frogs tell us? So there is a, uh, in the Pirkei Shir over there, it says that the frogs, the, what the frogs tell us in their croaking, they tell us the verse that we say right after the Shema. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed, which means blessed is the name and glory of God and his kingdom forever. <clears throat> How do we know this? Because by the frogs going ahead and fulfilling God's mission, God's mandate to to go everywhere and anywhere into the both the uh, ovens of the Egyptians into their stomachs everywhere they were in that way proclaiming the glory of Hashem as we find later I don't want to go into all the details as we find later with Hananiah Mishael Vazaria that when they were put to the test whether they should throw themselves in to the pit of the lions into the Kivshana Eish actually I believe it was the oven the fiery furnace, or bow down to Avodah Zarah, they learned from the frogs how one has to have mesirat nefesh, one has to have total self-sacrifice for the glory of God's name. Okay, so the the, the frogs of this, the parsha that we just read, they tell us. So every time you're going to a pond or at night, we sometimes hear the croaking of the frog, if you're spiritual enough, you should say, somehow on some spiritual level, the frogs are telling us about the greatness of God's kingdom. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on. <clears throat> when we talk about Mesirat Nefesh and self-sacrifice and where the frogs were ready to go, I want to now quote a verse in, in Tehillim and Psalms. I believe it's in chapter 139. And again, this will get us a little closer to the whole story with the tunnels. <clears throat> so there's a verse in Tehillim. I don't have a Psalms right here in front of me. Where in the Psalms, it says like this. Im esak shamayim, if I reach up to heaven, sham ato, you are there. Va'atziya sha'ol, hineko. And if I, 
go go down into the abyss, you're there as well. <clears throat> the simple verse is, you can't run away from God. I had a teacher, his name was Rebbe Lechaim Reutblatt. He was, when I was in yeshiva, he was a, um, he was a, a <clears throat> he was a genuine, pious Jew, a true God-fearing Jew. And he was also a highly disciplined and orderly Jew. He, he spent, you know, davening time, t- time for prayers were prayer, time for Torah study was Torah study. He was exemplary in terms of, um, <clears throat> in terms of his avodat Hashem, in terms of his, he was a true servant of God. I mean, you know, anytime you see truth and holiness, it impacts you. I remember I used to sit, I used to stand in 770, the headquarters of Chabad. He would stand by a wall. He was a very unassuming, he was actually a short man. He, uh, <clears throat> he was ex- humble to the, to the utmost. And he would stand on Shabbat in a corner and he would pray for hours. Every word said with such soul, with such devotion, with such yearning connection. And he did not know this, but I would stand and listen behind him just to hear how he prays. It had such an impact. And this Rebbe Chaim, who was, again, very orderly, very, very disciplined, would, what we call in the Hasidic circles, he would fabring. He had a fabring, which is like a Hasidic uh, get-together where you talk words of inspiration, Torah, and so on. He really only fabring and said a little Chaim to loosen up twice a year. It was Purim and Yutes Kislev. And I remember that he quoted this verse that I just mentioned from Psalms that says that in Esak Shamayim, Psalm from King David, in Esak Shamayim, if I, if I reach out to heavens, oh God, you are there. Vatsia Shol, even if I go all the way down to the abyss, you are there. Heaven and down below, you are there, wherever I go. And I remember he would after saying a little chaim, which was very unusual, very uncommon for him to say a little chaim, he would say like this. He says, there are those who read this verse, im esak shamaim sham ata. They read this verse and they cry. Oh, how, 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 um, how stifling it is. How unfortunate. I can't get away from God. If I go up in the heavens... God is there. I go down to the abyss. God is there. Wherever I go, God is there. And they say this sort of lamenting the fact, yes, I got to do what God wants because I have no choice because wherever I go, you know, my conscience, which God gave me, is there. That's the way some read this verse, you know, with tears in their eyes, sort of almost like mourning, almost like they're saying the tish above uh, Eicha, lamenting the fact that wherever I go, God is there. And then he would continue with all this positive and joyous energy. He would say, but a chassid, a pious Jew, when he reads this, he says this with great joy. He says, if I go to the heavens, God, you're there with me. If I go into the lowest abyss, which represents the challenges and the, and the struggles of life, you're with me. So I want to make, I want, I want to, I want to, I want to elaborate over here as we get to the sort of the, the tunnel situation. I got so many calls about it. Uh, Chaim. I want to give a little bit of a deeper explanation over here. In Esak Shamayim Shamat, and this is also related to Yud Shvat. This coming Shabbat is Yud Shvat, the 10th of Shvat which is the day that the previous Chabad Rebbe, the sixth Chabad Rebbe passed away, and the day that the Rebbe of our generation took on the leadership of Chabad. And I want to explain, and of course my objective is the positive, and the lesson that we can learn from all of this, with giving you a little insight into what I uh, feel comfortable at least sharing over here in this public forum to my friends over here on Facebook and on YouTube, of what's going on a little bit. But I want to give you a deeper insight into this verse. When the Rebbe became leader of Chabad, it was, it was a, 
it was a very dramatic moment because for a year, for a year, the Rebbe refused to take on the leadership of Chabad. <clears throat> and Hasidim, after the previous Rebbe passed away, sort of begged him to become the leader. You know, it's interesting that true Jewish leaders, you know, the political process that we're now going through, it's a year of election, a lot of tension, you know, from different sides. Um, you know, the process of becoming a leader in the Western world is that you have to really, you know, you have to, uh, um, you have to uh, appraise yourself. You have to present yourself in, you know, you have to, there's a certain arrogance that come with it. Comes with. It doesn't have to be that way, but a lot of times that's the case because it's about self-promotion. This is why I should be your leader. This is why you should vote for me. It could have, it could have a sense of humility, but it's very difficult. Okay? Whereas great spiritual leaders were people who did not um, self-promote. Moses, for seven days, refused God's request. He was the humblest of all men. It was only after all arguments with God was exhausted that he took it on. And once he took it on, he took it on with all his soul, with all his heart. The Rebbe... Rabbi Menachem and and the Rebbe of our generation, also for a year after his father-in-law passed away, refused to become the leader, saying he's not up for it. It's not. It's not what he wants. It's not. It's not who he is. Many different reasons that he gave. On Yud Shabbat, that was celebrating this Shabbat, he took on. A year later, the leadership of Chabad. And in that leader, in that role, or in that famous Fabrengen of Yud Shvat 1951, the 10th of Shvat 1951, he <coughs> said a famous, what's called a Maimur, a Hasidic discourse. And in that Maimur, he, he made it very clear what the mission statement of our generation, based, of course, on Torah teachings. And he said, that it is our mission, as the Medrash says, that God created the world to make a dwelling place down here below, Dira Bitachtonim. And the lower within this world we, we interact with, the more we achieve what God wants by transforming it and bringing the consciousness of God in the lowest of the lowest. No different than the frogs who are constantly croaking and screaming, Baruch Shem Kivod Machutolo Lamba Ed. However, however, there's, there, there's, there's, I want to add a deeper perspective to what I said before about the Tehillim. It's not just that the, the, the Psalms is telling us, if you go up to the heavens, God is there. If you go down into the abyss, God is there. He's, the, this, the, the Tehillim is telling us something very important and a deep and important message. What it's telling us is the following. And there's two nuances over here. One is that <clears throat> when it's not just telling us a statement which seems quite simple. Yes, of course, if I go up to the heavens, God is there. Bear with me for a moment because it's very hot in here. I want to just put on the AC. Okay, I guess I'm coming from New York where it was, you know, 20 something degrees. So uh, it's uh, the contrast over here is, is quite significant. So let me just put on the ear here for a moment right here from my uh, desktop and then we shall continue. So <clears throat> on, a, on a deeper level, I would say the following. It's not only telling us that God is in the heavens and God is below. It's obvious. For this, we need the psalmist to tell us this. He's telling us that two things, as I said, two nuances. Number one, he's telling us that you could be involved in the most heavenly things, the most holy of things. You could be involved in Torah. You could be involved in prayer. And it is devoid from its connection to God. How often do I hear and how often do I myself struggle with this? Just because I was brought, born, born and raised in a religious environment, so a lot of things can just become automatic and you could be learning, you could be praying, you could be doing what is lofty and holy things, which you should be doing, but God is not there. You forget 
you forget, I get questions often, how could a religious Jew uh, be dishonest? How can we do things which fall short? And the answer is, Im esak shamayim, even if you travel to the heavens, remember Shamata, don't forget to connect it and bring God into even the heavenly endeavors that you are involved in. And so too the other way around. Im esa im, im vatia shaol, if you find yourself in the abyss, you find yourself um, <clears throat> sort of mired in your own darkness or your own, your own uh, uh, in Yiddish we would say, your own grubkite. You have fallen so low spiritually that you feel totally lost. Remember, vatia shaol hineko, God is there too. Do not think that even in your lowest spiritual state that you cannot find God and return to God and bring God and connect and pull yourself out and even and even learn and transform that experience into a holy endeavor. And here I want to add the second nuance. And then we'll get to the story a little bit of uh, what I think many of you are waiting for. And the lesson that I think could be learned, and this is what I'm about to, to talk about. There's another nuance over here. I want to say like this, again, based on my being and teaching and being by the Rebbe for so many years and learning the, his teachings based on Hasidus and Torah and so on, is that because, and this is Yud Shvat, and because our mandate and mission of why our soul was put into this world and why we go out into the world and we work rather than just sitting in a synagogue all day and why we have to deal with the challenges and the mundane is so that we could bring Baruch Shem Kevod, we could hear from the frogs again and again. It's, you know, it's a message that we have to hear again and again until it penetrates. The reason for that purpose is, or not the reason, the way to affect that purpose is you have to connect the two. When can you impact the lowest of the low? When can you go ahead and not be dragged down and get lost into the shaol, into the abyss of materialism? Of, of, of temptation, of distraction, but on the contrary, to fulfill the purpose of our souls coming into this world, when you have a true connection and you realize that even in your spiritual endeavors, it is truly connected to God Almighty. So you have to be involved in the spiritual endeavors and it has to be, you, you have to realize, Im Esek Shemaim, Shem Ata, there you, God, are present. It's no different that when you, I saw last week where there was uh, divers who got lost in a cave. In order to get to them, they had to, they have to have this strong tether, this strong rope that's, that makes sure that as they're descending down below, they'll, they could, instead of getting lost in the cave, instead of helping those that they're trying to help, they themselves become endangered. You must remain, remain connected. <clears throat> so here we go. Let me tell you a little bit of what the situation with the tunnels are. This is not the whole story. It's not the place here to give the whole story. And I'm not here, I'm not here to sort of dump on these yeshiva boys, although I want to make it clear from the, from the get-go that I totally disagree with the actions, of course, that they have taken. But I want to explain a little bit and connect it to what we're discussing and the lesson that we could take from it. <clears throat> in the light, in the background of this whole discussion of Yud Shvat, of the frogs proclaiming, Baruch Shem Kavod Machusa Laolam Vad, blessed is the, Lord, the, the, the glory of Hashem. As they're going into the what's called in Hasidus and Kabbalah, the, the, the depth of, of klipa, the, the depth of unholiness, which is what Egypt represents, and in the strongest or the deepest opposition to holiness, they're proclaiming the glory of Hashem. Let me explain to you the, the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's um, amongst many things, the greatness and impact of the Rebbe. The Rebbe was a disruptor. You know, there are people who are disruptors. The Rebbe was a disruptor in the most positive way. When the Rebbe took over the leadership, Chabad was, was a handful. 
Chabad was had certain set ways and it was ready to sort of continue in those set ways. The Rebbe took the ideas of Chabad. So on the one hand, he was tethered to the highest of the high, the teachings of Torah and Hasidus, and he brought it down into the lowest of the low, where there was a lot of objection within the religious world. There was a lot of opposition because the Rebbe was a disruptor. People, what do you mean you're sending out shluchim? You're sending out people into, into the middle of Montana to open up a synagogue. How do you do that? How do you take the responsibility of, of those families that are going out of Brooklyn in a sheltered environment? What do you mean you're going to put mitzvah tanks on the streets of Manhattan? What kind of, what kind of, a, you, you attract too much attention. You're, you're, you're exposing the boys. I was standing in, on the streets of Manhattan as Yeshua boy asking people, are you Jewish? We got that inspiration from the Rebbe. In so many areas, the Rebbe was a disruptor in, 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 in holiness and positive, in positivity. Because on the, as a result of that, you had you have a situation where the Rebbe raised a generation of what I might call chutzpah You know what chutzpah in Yiddish means? If you know what a chutzpah is, you could give us a thumbs up. A chutzpah means somebody who is <coughs> who has chutzpah. That's what a chutzpah It's a Hebrew Yiddishized word. Because <coughs> the Rebbe really shook us up. I was at the Rebbe's Fabrengens, and the Rebbe would would. Would, would pull us out of our shluff, our spiritual shluff. Go out there, find a Jew, do a mitzvah with him, put on film with him, find out if he needs something, if he needs a place for Shabbat. Does he need help spiritually, materially? The Rebbe broke out of barriers. What, as a result of that, the, the education that we got was about just, just breaking out positively. But here, in here lies the danger. When you have that type of breaking out, you must, which means you enter into areas, which is Sha'ol, into the abyss. That's what tunnels represent spiritually, that it's not just this physical world, which is considered Tachtonim in Kabbalah and the Medrash, but within this world, you're going even below. That's what a tunnel represents. You have to make sure that you're so tethered to the instructions and the guidelines of Torah, because if not, you become even more destructive than the norm. So that's what I—that's my part of my observation, and and I have a pretty good feel. Now you could agree or disagree with me, but part of my observation, and more importantly, the lesson over here is these yeshiva boys, <clears throat> as by now you might have known, they were. Um, coming from a place where they were trying to disrupt, meaning they felt the headquarters of Lubavitch has to be expanded, and there is some basis and truth to that, but instead of being tethered to the guidelines that the Rebbe Chabad set, that you have to listen to authority, there's a process, there's a Torah process, there's a right and wrong process, they only went ahead and went symbolically and physically by creating these tunnels, and they were disruptive without the proper tethering if you're going to be involved in holy endeavors. To the extent that you want to go so low and break out, you have to remember Shammata. You have to, you cannot do so just because it's a holy endeavor. Is this what God wants from you? Is this what Torah wants from you? And for that, as the system of Torah is set up, you have to have a mentor, you have to have a teacher, you have to have, you have to go to those who are, who are your, your, your mashpiim, your spiritual mentors and so on. So <clears throat> that's the, that's the sort of the insight of what went on over here. At least part of it. Not completely, but part of it. But the lesson over here for all of us is the lesson of the makot of the tzfardeya. We need to continuously, as we are involved in the world around us, <clears throat> which is part of what our soul's descent into this world 
is we have to, in order to impact the world around us, to impact our kindalach, to bring holiness, goodness, kindness, the more you're exposed or the more you're disrupting the norms in a positive way, the more you have to be tethered to Torah, to holiness, to God within the Torah as you're studying the Torah. And that's what Yud Shvat is. That was the beauty and the power that the Rebbe inspired us and imbued us with, that you have to have both. You have to have and be connected to the holiest of the holy and not remain sheltered and keep it to yourself, but bring it forth, bring that beauty, bring that tradition, bring that power, bring that purpose, that meaning that we have in a world that is so hungry for meaning. We have to... That's our job, to be the frogs of this generation, both to ourselves and to those around us. That is my thought for the day. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. May we have success in fulfilling this, this beautiful lesson. And uh, may we merit. There's a positivity to tunnels. You know, we have tunnels. We have Hamas tunnels, which is, of course, as destructive as can be. But there's a positive tunnel. The positive tunnel is what the Gemara, the Talmud tells us in Tractate to Boat, that when the f- promise of the prophets will be fulfilled, which is the coming of Mashiach, God will miraculously create tunnels within the ground that all the righteous people will, through those tunnels, through those tunnels, enter into the Holy Land, which means that the, by achieving which, what, that which we both spoke, which was just spoke, meaning taking the highest power of holiness and bringing it down into the lowest, representing by tunnels, which is even beneath the normal ground, we will merit sort of mida connected mida, measure for measure, to the opening of those tunnels, to the most holy of holies, all the way to Jerusalem, with the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. Everybody have a good evening, and thank you for listening. Please share these words of Torah. And all comments and feedback are welcome. Lila Tov, good night.